I want to ask you this question. If somebody came up to you, you don't have to answer out loud, but if somebody came up to you and asked you the question, how to read the Bible, what would you say? If someone in your school asked you tomorrow, hey, how do I read and study the Bible, what do you think you would say? Maybe even as you're sitting there right now, what do you think about that question? If I were to ask you how to read the Bible, what is your response? Is it, boom, I got it? Or is it, I actually don't know? And I have some questions. And if you're in that spot, that's okay. And I wanna encourage you. Maybe you're doing good at this right now. I hope and pray that this message encourages you to keep going. But tonight, we're gonna get super practical, okay? I just wanna tell you that up front. There's gonna be a lot of opportunity for notes tonight. So if you have a journal or your phone, I want you to go to the notes app and we're gonna get super, super practical on what it looks like on how to read and study our Bibles. And the important thing I want you to know is this. Why are we talking about this? The reason why is because to get to know God, you have to read his word. That's the best way to get to know God is to read the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is alive. It's not just a a dusty old book with cool history, facts, and stories in it. It's alive. In fact, the first part of Hebrews 4, verse 12 says this. For the word of God is what? Alive and alive powerful. God's word contains life in it, and it will change your life if you let it. And and I'll tell you this about my story too. I remember seasons of my life where I did not take reading and studying God's word seriously, and those moments of my life were some of the darkest and loneliest moments. But when I opened up God's word for myself, I found out who he is and who he says I am. Am And it changed everything for me. It changed my life. The best way to get to know God is to read his word. So real quick, I'm gonna run through just a couple important things to remember whenever we are approaching, how do we do this? How do we read the Bible? I'm gonna talk about just for a second, some things that will help lead us to success whenever it comes to reading our Bible. Now really quick, before we get into those, I just wanna say the only bad plan is to not have a plan at all. The only bad plan when it comes to reading your Bible is to not have a plan at all. Not every plan is perfect. Not every plan is for every person, and that's okay. But the important thing is, is that we're getting in God's word. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be like Instagrammable with the coffee cup right here and the plant right here and all the high, like, like it, it, it's okay if it's not that way. The only bad plan is to not have a plan. So real quick, just a few things that will help set us up for success when it comes to reading our Bible. First thing is this. What are we going to do? We're going to choose a time and a place. We're going to choose, write that down. We're going to choose a time and a place. Here's the thing that matters most with this. Consistency. The consistency of the time and the place matters big time. So maybe for you, it's in the morning after you get ready. Maybe for you, it needs to become a part of your nightly routine. Before you go to bed, you're going to read God's word for a little bit. Maybe for you, it's on the way to school. Maybe for you, it's listening to it on the way to school, on the way to work. Whatever it is, we're going to choose a time and place that's consistent. I know for me, I'm trying to get in the habit of doing it in the morning. You don't have to do it in the morning if you're not a morning person. That's okay. I try to do it in the morning. And if you don't want to read in the morning, again, that's okay. What I would encourage you to do, though, is to seek the presence of God in some capacity in the morning. Starting your day off with God will lead to a more successful day. I promise you. So we're going to choose a time and a place. The next thing is this. We're going to pick a translation you understand. We're going to choose a time and a place, and we're going to choose a translation that you understand. Now, whenever I think about translations, there's a lot of translations in the Bible. If you've been around church a little bit or or maybe grew up in church, you may have heard of the KJV translation. That translation is like the older English. It's got a lot of these and thous, and it seems like they add the letters T and H at the end of everything. It's crazy. But, But here's the thing. That translation was written in 1611. We live in 2024. Language has changed a little bit since 1611, hasn't it? I doubt those people back in that time were saying words like riz and stuff like that, if we're honest, right? Language has changed, hasn't it? And so if you don't understand that translation, that's okay. 
let's find one that you do understand. And I've heard it said this way too. I think this is great. Whenever you're first starting to read the Bible, the, the best translation to pick is the one you're actually gonna read. The best translation to pick is the one that you're actually gonna read. Why? Because it helps build consistency in God's word. Just a recommendation for me, I use the NLT translation. I've used ESV, NIV, NKJV. Those are great ones that I found that help me understand it. You don't have to use those. Those are just great ones that I would recommend. So how are we gonna do this? What helps us set us up for success, right? Choose a time and a place, translation you understand. Next thing is this. We're gonna understand the context of what we're reading. Now, as I say that, it's important that you know this matters big time. The context of what you read matters big time because I don't know about you, but if you've read the first part of the Bible in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, sometimes you come across something and you're like, I have no idea what that means. It's important to understand the context. I think of my grandpa. Uh, I give him a nickname. The nickname I give him is Bubba Gump. He's got a little Texas twang to him. He's, he's awesome. He's super funny. Uh, my, my grandpa Harmon. And sometimes he's got these sayings that don't really make any sense. That he says them and you're like, Grandpa, I don't know what that means, brother. I'm going to need you to help me out a little bit. And he always has this one that he got from somewhere that he says to us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it to you and I'm going to explain it to you, okay? It's a little weird. He, would always, he still tells it to us too. He goes, all right, hey, man, you know what they say? Keep the rigs between the ditches and the smokies out your britches. <laughs> Apparently you've heard that too. But he would always say that to us. And I'm like, Lord have mercy, Grandpa. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Like, what in the world does that mean? And I actually called him today and asked him. I was like, You've never told me what that means before. What does that mean? And he gave me some context to help know what it means. He was just like, oh, yeah. It's just the context of driving safely on a road trip. Keep the rigs between the ditches means don't get in a car wreck. <laughs> and keep the smokies out your britches means don't get pulled over. Smokies are another word for cops, okay? So he explained that to me, and I was like, oh, that, that kind of makes sense. But in that moment, context of what he was talking about mattered, right? I had no idea what he was saying, but the context helped bring clarity. And that's the same way when we're reading our Bible. That's the exact same way. Some things that help me are this. If I'm reading a passage and I'm kind of confused, I read a little bit before and a little bit after to help bring some clarity. Another thing you could do is look up of these things called commentaries, and they just provide great detail and insight and things of history, and, and they just are super, super helpful to understand the context. So what are we gonna do? Choose a time and place, translation we understand, understand the context. Next thing is this. We're gonna ask questions as we read. We're gonna ask questions. Did you know when you're reading the Bible, it's okay? It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to not know every answer to everything. That's okay. And I have two main questions I want you to ask yourself whenever you're reading. I want you to write these down. The first question is this. What is this passage saying about God? What are these verses I'm reading saying about God? The next thing is this. What is God saying to me? What is this passage saying about God, his character, who he is, and what is he calling me to do? What is he telling me? What is he telling me I need to apply to my life? Last night, after, after young adults here, they had, they had this thing called night school. And the session was on how to read your Bible, and it, it fit perfectly. And Jared Bone, a pastor here, he did such a great job. And one of the sections he talked about was questions. And he said this, he said that if we're not careful, questions can become a barrier to us. They can cause us to just stop reading our Bible. Once we get to a part that's confusing, it can cause us to just stop reading our Bible. But he said this, and I thought it was so, so good. Let your confusion lead, let me read it, hold on. Let your confusion lead to curiosity. What does that mean? Let your confusion lead to curiosity. It means whenever you're confused, don't just stop. Ask a few more questions. Dig a little bit deeper, and you'll never know what you'll find about God's character and what he's telling you to do. So we're going to choose a time and place, a translation we understand. We're going to understand the context. We're going to ask the questions of what is this saying about God and what is God saying to me? And lastly, 
We're gonna pray that God speaks to us. We're just gonna ask him. Whenever you open his word, he's eager to listen to you too, by the way. He's eager for you to ask him that question, say, simple, God, I'm here again. I'm about to read my Bible, and I need your help. Would you show me something new about yourself? Would you show me something new I need to do to my life? God, would you speak to me? We're just gonna ask him. These things that we just talked about, time and place of consistency, translation that you understand, understanding the context, asking the questions, and praying that God speaks to us will help set us up for success whenever it comes to reading our Bibles. Because here's, here's the thing about the Bible I want you to know too. Whenever you think about the Bible, the Bible is meant to change your life, not just add information to your life. Think of it this way. The Bible, is, I've heard it said like this. The Bible is to transform, not just inform. The Bible is to change how you live. Again, like Miles talked about last week. Again, and also, if you haven't seen those two messages, they're on our YouTube channel, go watch them. They're awesome. They help bring a ton of clarity to what we're talking about. The Bible is to transform your life. Why do we do it? Because life is found in it. I love in, in John chapter 20, verse 31, is at the end of the gospel of John. And John writes this whenever it comes to the words that were written in that book. I love this. He says this, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Man, the words in the Bible, that's where life is found. And when you're looking at the life of Jesus, that's where life is found. We don't read this word just to be impressed by what Jesus can do, but we read it so we can be settled on who he is, and that's Savior. And maybe you're, you're wondering, like, I've never done that. Tonight's going to be the perfect opportunity to go for it, to read God's word. We're going to do it together in a few minutes. We're going to go through a method called SOAP. The salt method. Everyone look to the person next to you. Look right at him. Look at him in the eyes. Say, it's time to get clean. Let's go. Here, here's, here's the thing. Maybe, maybe you've heard of this method before. This method is called the soap method. What does this stand for? This stands for S, scripture. O stands for observations. A stands for application. And P stands for prayer. So we got scripture, observations, application, and prayer. And we're about to do this together tonight with a passage that's been on my heart the past week that has helped me so much that God really spoke to me. He's really helped me with a lot of things this past week based on one simple verse that we're going to look at and study together tonight. So as we do this, before we go into this verse we're gonna pray. We talked about things that set us up for success. We're gonna pray together right now that God would speak to us because I believe he can. This verse is so, so, so powerful. This verse has so much in it. It's one verse, but God's gonna to speak to us. I believe he will. Let's pray together real quick. Father, thank you for this time together. God, thank you that we just get to read your word. And God, I'm thankful that your word has life. So God, would you help your word come to life to us? God, would, would you speak to us right now? God, Maybe even tonight, would you help people take that next step into reading their Bible for the very first time? God, I'm so, 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 so thankful for this opportunity. Please bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we talked about things that are gonna set us up for success, right? We're gonna choose a time and a place. Boom, we have a time and we have a place right now. This is gonna happen. This is gonna be awesome. Next thing is this. What do we talk about? We're gonna choose a translation that we understand now as we were kind of talking about this message and talking about translations, there was a translation that was brought up that's a little interesting that I want you to see. This translation, correct me if I'm wrong, Wesley, Hawaiian pigeon. Hawaiian pigeon translation. Just bear with me for a quick moment. Hold on. Okay. One, I wrote this, so sorry about the handwriting. It's kind of tragic. Anyways, here's the thing. The verse, I appreciate it. Here's the thing. This verse that we're going to look at tonight is 1 Peter 
5, 7. So what I want you to do for the scripture, write down 1 Peter 5, 7. That's where we're going to be tonight. And we're going to talk about translations, right? If we're talking about that for a second. This Hawaiian pigeon translation to us may seem a little odd. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you. Here we go. Let God take care of all the stuff that body you guys. Because he got one big hop for you guys. Okay. That is true. Let's go. Here's the thing. This translation, at first glance, especially throughout the whole Bible, when we first look at that, we're like, sick. Like, that's awesome. Like, what in the world? And we may laugh at that, but, but here's the truth I want you to know. That there's a group of people that this translation was created for that need Jesus just as much as anyone else. They need Jesus just as much as anybody else else. And to them, this is super helpful. This makes sense. Whenever we look at this, we're like, what does that kind of mean? Maybe that's how they look at our translations of like the NLT or something like that. That makes sense to us, but it makes sense to them. And this translation is changing lives for eternity, okay? So it may be funny to us, but I just need you to know that this translation is changing lives. So now that we read it in a translation that's kind of like, we don't really know what that means. In just a second, we're going to read it in a translation that makes sense. I'm going to turn this around real quick. All right, let's do it. Here we go. First Peter 5, 7 says this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Super short. Super simple. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The word that sticks out to me there, uh, I, there's a few in, that we're going to look at in just a second, but the main one that sticks out to me is the word anxiety. Maybe even in this moment right now, you're dealing with some stuff that's making you anxious. Maybe this past weekend, there was just a lot going on, and it's, it's scary, and you've got some fear in your heart. Maybe whenever you walk into your school, your heart starts beating faster, <laughs> your hands start getting a little bit sweaty because you're anxious. Maybe you found yourself recently just in a season of your mind's just running. That's kind of where I've been recently. I've just been getting more anxious recently and it's been frustrating me and this verse has helped me a ton. I can even remember growing up, I, as a kid I was playing sports and I even remember getting anxious about those. I think I have a picture of myself as a kid, boom. Look at your boy. Shout out to my mom for writing that picture, and shout out to Time Hop. That was me actually in Springfield as a kid, played soccer. I thought I was that dude. I, I had the cleats, I had the, the knee pads, I had the cool soccer ball. And, and the thing that made me anxious about soccer was this, that on our team, everybody had to play goalie at least once. Everyone had to play goalie at least once. Guess what position I didn't want to play? Goalie, right? I wanted to be the dude that scored all the goals. And it would make me anxious, like, am I going to be goalie today? I don't really want to. Looking back, I should have just done it first and got it over with. Anyways, moments like that made me anxious. I can't even remember playing basketball growing up. My dad coached my team, and, and my dad played basketball in high school and in college. And, and honestly, in that area of my life, I just wanted to live up to my dad. He was really good at basketball. I just wanted to be good enough. I wanted to be even better than my dad. I just wanted to score all the points and it would make me anxious if I didn't play good, and I would get down on myself. And it's kind of kind of dumb, but have y'all ever eaten those, like, Gatorade gummies? Have y'all seen those? You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what those are, look those up. They're honestly kind of gas. I'm not going to lie. They're so good. But growing up, I would, <laughs> I would take a few of those before I played in the game thinking it was going to help me play better. Like, I would take a couple before a soccer game thinking I was about to turn into Ronaldo on the field. Or I would take a couple before I played a basketball game thinking I was about to turn into Michael Jordan on the court, right? Like, I thought those things were calming my anxiousness, and they didn't. And even now, there's still things that make me anxious. I struggle often with what people think. I struggle often with fear of the future. I struggle often with control and knowing everything. And I know some of you are walking through or have walked through anxious moments in your life. And this one verse this past weekend has helped me a ton. So what we're going to do right now, 
I'm about to write on this whiteboard. Hopefully you can see it. If, if not, here's the thing. Just take a picture afterwards, and it'll be great. And if you can't see it, what I want you to do too, we're taking notes together. Write the notes down that we write on this whiteboard, and you can refer to them later. It's going to be super, super, super helpful. So here's the first thing. What do we do? Scripture, right? We wrote that down. Whenever you're doing this on your own, what works for me is just writing the reference. First Peter 5, 7. Scripture. Boom. Knocked out. Next thing we need to look at is this. Observations. Whenever you're doing this, what do you see? Whenever you're reading verses in the Bible, what sticks out to you? What do you see? Now, for me, I see a couple, a couple words. The first word that I see is this, cast. I see the word cast. Another word that sticks out to me is this, the word all. The next one that sticks out to me is the word anxiety. Next, the word him sticks out to me. And maybe whenever you're reading this, this for yourself, these don't stick out for you, but this is just what sticks out to me. The next word is this, cares. And the last word is you. Now, that's pretty much the whole verse, right? But those are the main words that stick out to me whenever I read this. And to simplify this down, in my head, I see a model of this. What, where, and why. A model of what, where, and why. Now, what do I mean by that? When I think about the word what, I think of what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? The first thing is this. I'm supposed to cast all my anxiety. That's the what I'm supposed to do. So the what are these right here. Cast all of your anxiety. That's the first step. The next is this, okay? If I'm casting my anxiety somewhere, where do I do that? This verse says, you cast it on him. You cast your anxieties onto God. Cast all of your anxieties onto him. And as I was reading this verse, I came across a commentary that talked about this word of casting. And the idea is this. In this culture, this word was referred to letting go of a heavier burden. And the commentary even says someone would let go of a heavy burden and put it on a camel's back. A.K.A. letting go of something that you're holding onto that's heavy and giving it to something that's designed to carry it. Because here's the deal, a lot of us are holding on to this anxiety and it's heavy. And the longer you hold on to it, the heavier it gets. You ever been there? I've been there with plenty of things. And I wanna tell you, you were not created to just hold on to those anxious moments. You were created to cast it on the one who created you because he loves you more than you know. And that's the why. The what, where, why. Why do we cast all our anxiety onto God? Because he cares for you. What, where, why. That's just a couple observations, just from one verse, one sentence, one line in some of your Bibles. Cast all of your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. He's a personal God. And another commentary said as I was reading that in this, in this culture, these people some Roman people would make up these, these gods. And in their mind, the idea of a god was this. They could picture a god who was good, but they could never picture a god that cared for them. They could think of this god that was, that was good and like cool and like kind of fun to worship, but they could never picture a god that cared for them. And that verse, 1 Peter 5, 7, tells me that the god of the Bible cares for me. He sees me personally. He knows me, and he cares for me. So we see some observations. Cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. We see the what. Cast all your anxiety where? Onto God, onto him, because he is strong. Why? Because he cares for you. The next part, application. Scripture, observations, application. What do we do with this? And, and as I read this, a couple things I think about 
that can apply to our lives right now are a couple characteristics of who God is. The first one is this, is that God is powerful. God is powerful. We're talking about casting our anxiety onto him. And the idea is letting go of a heavy burden. And for me, I'm anxious about a lot. I got a lot of things going on in my head. And if I'm anxious about a lot, that means it's heavy. And that tells me God's strong. That tells me God's powerful. I wasn't designed to create, to to, to carry this anxiety on my own. Jesus, I think, is saying to some of you here tonight, you've been carrying your anxiety for forever. And he's trying to tap on your shoulder and say, hey, you were not designed to carry that on your own. I'm strong enough. I can carry it. And we're called to cast our anxiety on to him. This tells me God's powerful. This also tells me this, that God's personal. He's powerful, and God is also personal. We cast our anxiety onto him who's strong, who is our strength, because we weren't designed to carry those on our own, so we cast it onto him because he's powerful and he's strong. But here's our why. Because he cares for you. Think about that. Cast your anxiety onto him because he cares for, fill your name in there, you. He's a personal God who wants a personal relationship with you. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for all of your sin, past, present, future, paid for. Because that sin separates us from a perfect and holy God. And since he is a powerful and a personal God, he didn't want it to stay that way. And what Jesus did on the cross by dying for our sin and raising again, what we're going to celebrate on Easter in just a few days, raising again so that we could have life, putting your faith and trust in that is the only way to experience the salvation that God offers you. It's the only way to experience the eternal life and to spend eternity with your creator by putting your faith and trust in that, not just some of the things that you can do, but what Jesus has already done for you in your place. He's a powerful God. He's a personal God. So what are we gonna do? This tells me it's time to pray. Write that down. It's time to talk to God. It's time to be real with him. This says cast all of your anxiety. We looked at that word all. That word all right here, that matters. Because God wants you to be real with him. He's not scared of that. And here's the thing. He knows. He sees you. I don't know about you, but that's so comforting to me. That he's a personal God that sees and knows me. He's powerful and he's personal. And another application question I think I would ask you is this. Where are you casting your anxieties? Because maybe for some of you in the room, it's not on God. Maybe for some of you in the room, you're trying to cast your anxieties onto the idea of a relationship and not having somebody makes you anxious, so I'm just gonna go seek that for, for the peace I'm not getting. Or maybe for you, it's just identity. If I get to this status, then the peace that I'm searching for will, will, will fill me up. Maybe it's money. If I just work these jobs, I'll get money to go to college and I'll get this car and then, the, and then I'll, I'll be good. I'll be able to take a breath. Maybe it's your, your grades. Getting the perfect grades is where you're seeking peace. And that's not what this verse is telling you to do. It's telling you to cast your anxiety on to him. Another place in the Bible in Philippians that talks about don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Whenever we cast these anxieties onto God, that verse in Philippians talks about he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that that goes beyond what we can understand when we cast everything on God. Lastly, prayer. And what I do for this moment when I do this personally, I just write out prayer points and I just pray them. So the first one I want you to write down, I'm just gonna write down anxious. And what I would do, I would just pray about whatever I'm anxious about. Whatever's heavy on my heart, Whatever's making me scared, whatever's making my mind run, I would just pray about what I'm anxious about. The next thing I would pray about is to ask God for his peace. 
say, God, you're the God that gives peace beyond all understanding. I need that right now. I need your peace. Here's what's heavy on my heart. I need your peace. And the last thing I would encourage you to pray about when it comes to this verse is this, is pray for God's power. Pray for God to show you his power in your life. Pray for God to show you his strength in your life. So, we think about one verse. I'm going to read it one more time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Man, we just practically studied the Bible together. We just did that. And we got all of that from one verse. That's cool. Imagine what you could get if you dug a little bit deeper into five verses. Imagine what it would look like to develop that consistent time and place and ask God questions and ask him to speak to you and read our Bible consistently. It would change you. It would change the people in your schools. Man, God could do some amazing, amazing things. And the reason why I chose, chose this, this specific verse, it's been super helpful for me this past weekend and, and honestly kind of heavy on my heart. Um, last Friday, I was just dealing with anxiousness heavy. Like, it, it just hit me out of nowhere. I was doing an assignment for school, and I'm graduating from college this May, and so it, it had me just thinking about the future, and, and it just had me, my mind spiraling, honestly. It had me thinking about the future, and then I started getting anxious about what people thought of me, and then I started getting anxious about living up to people in my family that work at churches, and, and it just felt so, so, so heavy, but, but I was also getting frustrated because I've, I've been trying to, to not really think about it and not really let it affect me, but it was just kind of building and, and sitting there. And then the thing that kind of set me over the edge was as I was feeling those things and, and thinking about those things, I got a text just regarding my future, just asking about it. And that's the thing that set me over the edge. And what I did next was dumb. And I'm not saying this is okay. I was just so frustrated. I looked for the first thing that wouldn't do any damage. <laughs> and it was my brand new stick of deodorant. Okay, But what I did, I was so mad. I just grabbed it and I just threw it at my wall as hard as I could out of frustration. And I shouldn't have done that because <laughs> my deodorant stick broke and it was new and I had to get a new one. But, but here, here's what I'm trying to say to you. In that moment, what I was not doing was casting my weight upon God. I was not casting and, and throwing the things that weigh me down onto God. I was trying to white knuckle life and cling to thoughts about what people thought of me in the future and, and all of this stuff. And, and after I threw my deodorant against the wall out of frustration, again, I should not have done that. I kind of calmed down for a second and realized I was like, I shouldn't have done that. And it was like Jesus just kind of came and tapped me on the shoulder and was like, hey, you're okay. What if you tried to cast your anxiety onto me? because you weren't designed to carry it and I'm strong enough. And that's what I wanna encourage you with tonight is that whatever you're anxious about, Jesus is saying, hey, trust me, cast it onto me. I am strong enough. And the reason you are able to trust this verse right here, cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. The reason you're able to trust that is because if Jesus defeated sin and death itself, he's strong enough for you to cast your anxiety onto him. Jesus defeated death. And he's saying, hey, come on. Man, I defeated death. I'm, I'm strong. Cast your anxiety onto me. Let's go. I'm here. I'm powerful and I'm also personal. I'm right here for you. So tonight, we think about doing the soap method, right? I'm gonna challenge you. We're gonna have a moment after service where you're gonna break out into your small groups for a second and we're gonna start another Bible reading plan together. We just finished one through the book of Ephesians and we're gonna start another one in the Gospel of John. And I'm gonna challenge you, try the SOAP method for 21 days. It's a 21 day plan. Try the SOAP method. And also, again, I'll say this. If, if this isn't working for you, that's okay. Remember, the only bad plan is to not have a plan at all. 
Because when we think about the Bible, the best way to get to know God, I need you to remember this, is to read God's word. Because the Bible was meant to change your life and transform your life, not just add information to your life. Because in the Bible is where life is found. And as we close, what I'm going to ask you to do is bow your heads for me and close your eyes. And what this does, this right here, just creates a moment between you and God. So maybe you're here tonight and you're like, Isaac, there is some anxious stuff I'm going through. Some things are weighing heavy a little bit. I'm I'm getting nervous about some things and and I'm anxious. And here's what I want to do. In a moment of boldness, if you're feeling anxious about some things, would you just slightly raise your hand in the air? I just want to pray for you. I appreciate that honesty. And I want to tell you, if you raised your hand, you weren't the only one. And I'm proud of you for raising your hand because that takes courage. What I want to encourage you to do right now in this moment, if you're feeling anxious, talk to God right now. Tell God about that thing. We're going to live this verse out right now. Cast that anxiety onto God. Cast it onto him. Tell him the details. Tell him everything. Tell him how you're feeling. He's not scared of it. He's a God that's powerful and a God that's personal. Cast your anxiety onto God because he cares for you. And when you think about a God that's powerful and also personal, we talked about it a little bit ago, but what Jesus did on the cross is for you. The Bible talks about how Jesus died for the world. God so loved the world, and you are included in the world. God loves you. And maybe you're here tonight, and you're like, Isaac, man, something's missing. I'm feeling anxious, and, and I, don't, I don't really know every answer. I don't, I don't know everything, but something's missing in my life. I'm going to tell you that thing that's missing is Jesus, because ultimate hope and peace and joy is found in him. And he's offering you a free gift of eternal life that's only found in and through what he has done on the cross for you by dying and raising again. And what I want to invite you to right now in your seat is a moment of response to that. Man, if you want to start that relationship with Jesus, if you're like, Isaac, I need that. Something's missing. Can I tell you, don't wait another moment. That's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Don't leave this room. Don't leave that seat with making a decision for God. And if you want to start that right now, pray this with me. Say, say, Jesus, man, I need you. I see my sin. And I see how that separates me from you. And I believe that what you did on the cross and raising again is for me. Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you save me? Jesus, I give you my life. And as we stay in an attitude of prayer, man, if you did that, one, I want to ask you again in a moment of boldness, if you did that tonight, would you slightly raise your hand in the air? We got leaders that would love to have a convo with you about what that looks like and what that looks like moving forward. And if you don't want to to raise your hand, that's okay. That's why moments after service matter so, so much. And I hope tonight encouraged you. I hope it challenged you to get in God's word and, and see what it says for yourself. Because the best way to get to know God is to know his word. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this time tonight. God, I just thank you for an opportunity to study your word. God, I'm thankful that Such a short verse shows us so much about who you are. God, I pray tonight that students would be challenged to read their word. God, this message was from me. I needed that verse. Thank you for helping me. And I pray you would help students this week too. God, tonight, if there's anything I said that that was against you or your word, would you help people forget it? God, would you just help us remember the truth of who you are? God, thank you for speaking to us tonight. I pray you would speak to us as we go through this Bible plan together as a group. And and God, I pray that you would change people's lives. God, thank you for how good you are and how good you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen.